My name is Bob Plankers. I'm the ghost of Tech Field Day past. Uh, the, uh, um, at one point, I was, at several points, I was on the other side of the table. The, uh, I can be at the other side of the table now, probably <laughs> annoying Ben back there. But uh, uh, I joined VMware six months ago. I am a technical marketing architect in our cloud platform business unit. VMware is aligned into different business units. And uh, the one that we, the one that I'm part of, we deal with vSphere and uh, we deal with VMware Cloud on AWS. And here, let me just... That's a slot. We take, mm. we take this job pretty seriously, you know, as the foundation of the software defined data center as VMware sees it. And uh, that's a big responsibility. Foundations are, are hard work, you know. The, it, to some extent, it's the damned if you do, damned if you don't sort of thing. Change is hard at a foundational level, but change is absolutely necessary at times in order to you know, provide stable foundations for the things above it. I mean, foundations, talk about foundations. Look at the Millennium Tower in San Francisco. It's a good example of why foundations are really important, you know, buildings tipping over and that, even Leaning Tower of Pisa and things like that. So, a product line, vSphere is really old. It's fundamentally, that doesn't mean it's, you know, it's still really old, but it's been around for a long time. But it, and it's fundamentally different every release. There's a, uh, uh, it's fundamentally different from what it was five years ago, 10 years ago. Uh, from w when I started with it, ESX 152 back in, I don't know, 15 years ago. It's a little scary at this point. <laughs> and there are two real big ideas that that come to mind when we're talking about security or vSphere in the, the security space. You know, the first one is really the idea that we try to make it easy to do the right thing. You know, humans, this all comes back to humans and humans kind of stink. You know, they will take the easy way out. They've got other things to do, their wife or husband or partner calls and like, you know, they forget about stuff, you know, they configured five things and forgot about the sixth thing and like now there's some sort of problem there and, you know, how do we, how do we work on that? And furthermore, staff time in an IT budget is, is one of the largest line items there is. How do we... How do we maximize that? How do we maximize? How do we help our customers ma maximize that spend? You know, IT and security in particular is not something that drives an organization forward, right? It's all. It may keep the organization from sliding backwards, but it's not something that moves an organization forward by itself. And so, by making it easy to do the right thing, making it easy to get some of the stuff done automating, things like that. We can really have an impact on, on staff time and even just the will to live by some of the IT folks out there, you know? So what are these things that I speak of, you know? Uh, thinking about the things that we can make easy. We're a room of nerds here, you know, and I like to joke that if there's, how many of us are there, there's, you know, uh, you know, the whole room has probably got 20 people in it. There's probably 25 different opinions about what the, uh, um, what constitute, what are the things we should be looking at. I usually come back to the sort of fundamentals of information security. You know, the CIA triad, the confidentiality, keeping our data to ourselves, integrity, making sure our data is authentic the way we left it. Thank you, please don't touch my data. And available, you know, availability. You know, it's there when we need it. And uh, that's a really important point, too. It's a very subtle point availability is that, you know, we need it when we need it, but then sometimes we don't need it. It plays into patching, things like that. It's a, you know, we'll get to patching. Patching is, patching is hard. You know, the five people on earth that patch. So the, uh, uh, oh, did I say that out loud? I'm really sorry. So the uh, apparently no internal monologue like Homer Simpson this morning. Uh, let's see. So, you know, thinking about all the things that we do in this regard, that IT does. You know, a CISO is really a policy position and a compliance auditing position. It's not the, the forefront of security. Most of the security stuff we think of, operational day-to-day -day falls on a lot of the operations folks, the, you know, the, the front lines of IT. And that's also a really important distinction, so. 
You know, I learned a long time ago that the uh, that if I phrased what I was asking for in terms of these things, and then also in terms of risk, this is all about risk, right? Risk management, mitigating risk, things like that. Uh, that I'd get what I was asking for, you know, out of a business, out of an organization, you know, and that's actually, uh, that's really cool, you know, I like getting what I ask for, you know, I'm spoiled sometimes in that regard, but uh, uh, the relating it back to business ideas, relating our security desires and dreams and wishes and things like that, hey, you know, we should do some, we should do this, uh, not just because it's a good idea, technically, or it's cool, but it mitigates risk. It plays into one of these three categories. You know, so looking, I, I made a quick list of all of the vSphere features that I could think of. I, it took like five minutes and, and wrote down all of the features that I could think of that even, that remotely relate to risk, you know? And this list is incomplete. The uh, vSphere has been around for a while and just, Sort of as an aside here, you know, there's things on this list. V VMware has been growing. There's things on this list we've sort of forgotten about. They're so old that we've forgotten about. I met somebody not that long ago, DRS, Dynamic Resource Scheduler. It's, I won't say AI or anything like that. It's not, it's a set of rules, you know, but it's a machine. It, the computers watch themselves, you know, to balance the workloads. I met somebody that doesn't believe in that and mind boggling, you know, the, uh, uh, that's a real, that's an availability thing. EVC, we're gonna talk a bunch about uh, enhanced vMotion compatibility, especially around CPU vulnerabilities, things like that. The, uh, uh, the idea that we can mask out CPU instructions so that the new CPU families are compatible with the old CPU families, that we can expand our clusters, things like that, and do that easily. That's a real operational bonus from using vSphere. The, uh, here, let me look at my notes here. Uh, most of these things, too, in the easy to use category, most of these things are configurable with a checkbox or a drop down menu. The uh, uh, encrypted vMotion is something, you know, it's a per VM setting. You can say, no, I don't want it, which, you know, I would have questions. Uh, yes, I always want it, which I don't have any questions, good choice. Or, uh, it's, uh, or set it to opportunistic. If you can do it, please do it, you know. Three options, done, you know. Uh, secure boot is a checkbox. Uh, VBS, virtualization based security. It's a little bit of Hyper-V, it's nested Hyper-V for Windows. It creates a secure memory space in a Windows guest OS using Hyper-V components. A lot of work went into that, it's a checkbox. It's, it's got a whole bunch of warnings after it, like, hey, I'm gonna turn on all this other stuff. But there's this law of conservation of complexity you know, anytime that something looks easy, there's always this deep, complicated <laughs> stuff underneath it. And uh, uh, that's especially true with hyper-converged and, and things like that. But, you know, making it easy to do the right thing is really important to us. People can move on with their lives. The other thing, too, is we can take all those features and map them back into the CIA triad, you know, directly into this. And who cares about this? Well, you know, if I want to turn something on, say I encounter an organization that doesn't believe in DRS. Well, DRS ad addresses a component of this and it's likely more and more organizations now are really worried about compliance as well. You know, compliance being what it is, the uh, 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 people are worried about meeting regula regulatory need, uh, requirements and things like that. And a lot of the compliance frameworks map back into this triad as well, directly. You know, NIST 800-53 is an especially good example. You can really see the delineations there. And uh, that, you know, from a business perspective, communicating that back up the stack, you know, I, d I don't want to turn on DRS just because it's cool. You know, there's a real goal in mind. So I mentioned compliance, you know. Compliance is usually how the conversation starts, at least in my world at VMware. You know, people trying to be compliant with something. There's lots of things, you know, the beauty of standards is there's many to choose from. Uh, you know, trying to be compliant with them. Compliance is not security. Security, you, you folks know this. Security is also not compliance. Are they related? Absolutely, you know. 
Uh, I like to call them kissing cousins. They're, uh, uh, you know, and they're often the compliance is like the gateway drug to actual security in many cases. You know, the uh, uh, <laughs> and yeah, first one. I don't know if the first one's free or not, but the uh, uh, you know, and the drug dealer model, but. You know, it gets the conversation started. Somebody saying, hey, we need to be PCI compliant. We need to, to meet NIST 800-53, that sort of thing. But, yeah, you know, there's a lot of compliance, too, that's misrepresented as security. You know, it's, and that, I think, my theory on that is, and bear with me, my theory on that is because compliance frameworks are just guidelines. And they're me telling you that, hey, you should go to St. Louis, Missouri, but I don't tell you how to get there. And that is just befuddling to uh, most, you know, IT operations folks out there, you know. So what do I do? Well, you know, go to, go to Missouri, you know, go to St. Louis. Well, how do you want me to get there? I don't care, you know, like, but you need to be there. And, uh, you know, so how do you map that together? And, and that's where you run into problems sometimes because, these uh, compliance shows up as this prescriptive sort of framework. In order to meet X, you need to turn on security control Y. And that, there's, there's not a correlation there necessarily. You know, compliance frameworks have uh, never survived contact with the applications. You know, the uh, applications, especially things that operate in PCI spaces and, you know, do credit card processing are some of the worst things out there as far as, you know, being operationally secure and things. They want to be logged in as administrator to a, a, a Windows Server 2003 box. You know, they need console access, things like that. And, and so the idea of compensating controls that a compliance framework is a discussion. It's a starting point for discussion. And where you end up is the actual security controls. And that's really why I've got a lot of respect for people in this room and people who do security in general. Because all you folks need to be real serious generalists. You need to know a lot, a little about a lot of stuff. You know, you need to be very creative about solutions. You need to, and you know that's that's not for everyone for sure you know so monitoring tools i mentioned the prescriptive nature of of compliance frameworks or how they're presented to it operations monitoring tools are especially heinous in this regard you know the there many of them are it's my way or the highway you know i'm going to check for this control and this control maps exactly to this uh security uh, the compliance framework requirement and if you're not doing it that way oh my god you're we're all going to die you know and <laughs> the uh, uh well we might, or I'm probably gonna die at some point, hopefully not in front of you here, but the, uh, 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 I'm looking to spend the rest of my life alive, yes. But the, uh, uh, um, the monitoring tools, tools of that nature, automations need to be more flexible. We've been working a lot with uh, Shameless Plug, vReal is operations manager. We've been working a lot with them lately. When I joined VMware, uh, they made the mistake of asking me what I thought. And about in these areas, yeah, Edward's laughing. <laughs> he and I have talked a lot about what he and I think about things. And the, uh, um, and one of my main comments was it needs to be more flexible. It needs to be, you know, uh, where I come from, we used to have a saying called get the red out of our, you know, uh, borrowing a, a phrase from a, an eyedrop company, but getting the red out of our monitoring systems. A monitoring system that is always red, always is red X's that Tom was joking about earlier is crap it's unusable you know like it's just it's like the warnings that pop up in web browsers and things uh you know that people just learn to click through yeah 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 whatever and all you did was teach somebody to click through this stuff you know and uh, the same is true of monitoring systems that are always red x's so unless they're flexible enough to accommodate what we've done as far as compensating controls and things they're, they're not particularly helpful. We will spend more time dinking around with the actual monitoring solution than we will, you know, actually getting work done. And like I said, this is all overhead. We're not moving the organization forward. We're just sort of keeping up with the Joneses, as it were. Anyhow, I digress. The, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about compliance. Uh, I want to start with the, I know compliance, we love compliance, all that, you know, but again, gateway drug. The, uh, um, I'm sorry if I keep blocking you here. Uh, the VMware validated design. 
you know, so many of our customers, well, how do I deploy this stuff? You know, that's a, you know, very fundamental question. And so we've got VVDs, VMware validated designs, given away freely. I mean, you can ask a partner or a VAR or somebody to build one of these for you, no problem. You can ask Dell for one, whatever. But, you know, if you want to look at it, it's got all of our best practices around isolation. We're big on isolation. We like isolation, you know. Keep, you know, keep everyone away from each other. It's like a British soccer game sort of thing, you know. The, <laughs> the uh, uh, which is just, yeah, that was an interesting experience when I've been there. Uh, but VVDs, you know, don't address compliance yet we're releasing a this is breaking news by the way the uh, uh, we're releasing the uh, a compliance add-on to the top of this you know so I built this thing so how do I make it compliant well NIST 800-53 that actually maps really nicely back into PCI and things like that there's a lot of commonalities there and so uh, uh, releasing this there are 517 different controls that need to be audited in a VVD deployment and uh, this has got all of them in there. You want a list of them? Here it is. This is available up in communities. It'll be uh, uh, it'll be generally available. Yeah, Edward, what's going on? Do you actually have a script that'll monitor them all? I I bet our ISBU folks do. I don't personally. I will. It ask would them. be nice if it, that was yeah. actually shipped with the document mm -hmm. because having a document where I have 570. Controls, oh yeah, you know, like oh, making all of our customers write their own script to do that. You would know, be like I, at that. you know, I mean, but not that mean. You know, like, yeah, <laughs> we, yeah, it's you know, should that's, be bundled with the VVD. Correct. The uh, uh, you know, yeah, there's chickens, there's eggs, there's carts and horses, and you know, like the, having a list of what to check for, and then we need to, yeah, we'll build something for it. So I'll build it for you, dedicated is, to Edward Holetke. Is, so, but is that the chicken so or the egg? ISBU might not dedicate it to you, but <laughs> think of me when. Anyhow, you know, on the compliance front, the uh, we also just received word last week that the Defense Information Security Agency, DISA, DISA, DISA. Yeah. DISA. Uh, I always call it DISA, and then somebody corrects me. So this has worked out just fine. <laughs> the, uh, um, it's finally released a Stig for 6.5, you know. Uh, you might say, hey, Bob, isn't 6.7 the latest version? Yeah, you're right. You know, yeah, this is slow. So mm -hmm. it's a government agency. You know, there's government shutdowns and things like that. So, but uh, Stigs, how do you get a Stig? How do you check to see if somebody's got a Stig? It's the Stig website. There's a new Stig website. It's kind of blurred out here or whatever. But uh, uh, the only place to check to see if somebody's got a STIG, an actual STIG, not something they're calling a STIG, is the DISA site. NIAP, Common Criteria Certification. We submitted uh, ESXi 6.7 Update 2 for this. And I mentioned this not to bludgeon you all over the head with all of our cool you know, and boring compliance things, but this actually has the NSA checking our work. And that's, that's really cool, actually. You know, it's actually a complete pain because they're telling us stuff, you know, and we have to fix it or we have to explain ourselves and things like that. But it's good to do that from time to time. And there's a lot of uh, folks around the world that really care about this sort of thing. So we're in evaluation now. The upshot, and I mentioned this, I go into a, a prolonged conversation about this uh, because it really has profound effects on the whole stack, all of our customers. The changes that we're making as a result of our conversations with the NSA are positive for security. And if you patch, if you're one of the six people in the world that patch your stuff, the, uh, um, you know, please patch. If there's one thing, please patch. And change your passwords once in a while, would you? But the, uh, um, <laughs> those are really the two things, right? You know, the good password and account hygiene and just get rid of the vulnerabilities. But um, everyone who uses ESX will benefit and is benefiting from these updates. Yeah, do, do we announce them as a massive fanfare, like, hey, we fixed something that the NSA wanted us to fix? No, they get snuck in to the, the read the release notes. You'll see them. So anyhow, I get to the grandfather of all of this stuff, the VMware security, the vSphere security hardening guide. And a guy by the name of Mike Foley, you might uh, recognize that name. The, uh, he is my partner in crime. I'm probably his partner in crime. Uh, it's not a Batman Robin relationship, please. But the uh, uh, I'm the other half of that. Uh, you know, uh, doing security in tech field. A my coworker Nigel in back is uh, uh, laughing at me now. But uh, um, oh, this is really Mike's baby. It's the the root of all 
the vSphere hardening controls. And it evolves, it evolves over time. Edward and I were talking earlier about evolving it back to actually include some things that uh, we've taken out because of security to by, by default. And we'll talk about that in a second here. The, uh, um, but the hardening guide not only has been a list of things that customers should do to improve their own security, it becomes a to-do list for our product managers. You know, one of our product managers is sitting in the room with us right now, you know, like it's a to-do list for Ken there. And what do, what do we do? Are there defaults in this product that need to be set better? And over time, you can, you can see that we've had a positive impact here. vSphere 5.5, there were something like 37 different things that we forced our customers to tweak. You know, and that sucks. You know, you've got better things to do. You want to go drink beer and hang out, you know, pet your cats and ferrets and things like that. You know, do theater, like all this stuff, you know. And uh, uh, my community theater had really good wireless uh, for a variety of reasons. And, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, mostly dealing with this sort of stuff on the fly. But over time, we've been able to push that down. Six, seven has got five things. And really that comes down to two things in the default uh, the default V switch uh, permis it allows promiscuous mode still, and it allows forged transmits by default. And we want to turn. Yeah, I know we're we're working on it. Just chill out. Yeah, I know. But you know, if we change that midstream, our entire partner ecosystem goes. Hey, we were making some assumptions here. Well, you know, so first we gotta, you know, work on the assumptions, and then yeah. So. Enough commentary aside there, but the, uh, uh, the other two are some possible denial of service sorts of things with the in-guest disk wiping and disk shrink things. You can cause a whole lot of I.O. to your, uh, to your disk, your storage devices, and, you know, denial of service yourself or others. So, uh, and then there's always the one, the one in the future. We will never take patching out of the list. Please patch. Please patch. I don't have, yeah, this is mostly for people on camera. Please patch and change your passwords. Hey, Bob, <laughs> should you patch? Pardon me? Should you patch? I, I recommend patching. So. Bob, I got a quick question. On. Yeah, go for it. Best practices and, you know, you're, you look at this list of going from 37 down to five, potentially one, mm -hmm. because of the, the patch aspect of it. Best practices are always a tough thing to do because what you define as a best practice is not necessarily a best practice that is truly. This is a guideline too. This is a compliance practice. framework, you know. So I mean, when you when and I, I'm glad that you brought that up as there's things like the promiscuous mode where if you change that setting now, maybe you've got a DHCP server and you need it or whatever, you know, yeah, like you, forge you break, transmits. You break so much oh, yeah. other stuff. Yeah. You're hitting on a really good point that I've actually, it was in my notes and I completely skipped over in one of my tangents here. Welcome to mm -hmm. me talking. All right, I got you is, back on track now. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. The, uh, um, uh, this is always why I like the Tech Field Day crew. But the, uh, <laughs> um, watching my back. The idea that it's secure by default, but if you need to change it, you can still put it back. You know, like if for some reason you don't like TLS 1.2 and you want to turn 1.1 or 1.0 back on, go for it. You know, like if you want to go backwards, we can loosen this. In fact, we don't even call it the, the hardening guide anymore. We actually call it the security configuration guide because the defaults have changed to be the hardening, so the hardened settings. Now what's left is just auditability, you know? What's, uh, what's left is things that need to be set, NTP servers, you know, uh, choices that you need to make that we can't make for you because every environment's different, you know? The other big joke is what would be the motto of IT? Well, it depends, right? You know, and, uh, uh, and we, we really take that to heart around the flexibility there, so. Answer the question? Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's, that's what I always struggle with is because when you walk into any customer environment, it's always, well, that's not what so-and-so guide says. And you're like, well, that doesn't necessarily mean that that is quote it's unquote. It's a conversation, you know. It yeah. should be a conversation starter. And you should arrive at, you know, the journey is not the destination here as like many travel websites say, you know. No, the destination is the destination and it's mm -hmm. security, you know. Like it's a hard perimeter, bad actors on the one side and all the cool people on the other side, you know. And so, yep. yeah. Thoughts? I'm pretty much... Oh, 
I've got one other slide. We've got a, a, a security response group that manages all of the, you know, somebody discovers there's a Postgres vulnerability out there, and oh my goodness, you know, like it turns out we use Postgres, you know, and vCenter and things like that. What are we doing about it? They manage that sort of thing. There's a whole security development life cycle that they run through as well. You know, the static code analysis, try to catch our own stuff where we can, you know, and then do pen testing on our own equipment, on our own VVDs and, and things like that. Uh, do we catch everything? No. But the, we work with researchers. If you look at a lot of the release notes and security, the VMware security guides that are out there, the advisories, there's a lot of thanks to researchers. Uh, we also participate in uh, uh, hacking contests, Pwn to Own, things like that. In fact, uh, um, they, uh, uh, the Pwn to Own folks made about 100K off of us last fall, uh, giving us a couple of VM escapes. Thank you, you know, and just like any other already patched. It's already <laughs> patched. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, we had, so you should we patch. Had, you should patch. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You win. The, uh, um, what you win, I don't know. But the, uh, <laughs> uh, more security vulnerabilities. But the, uh, uh, um, we had engineers on call for that, you know, that worked over a weekend to get it figured out, get it QA'd, all that sort of stuff. This is serious business, and we take it very seriously.